didn't even kiss anyone on the first date. And I don't know why I couldn't resist kissing Elvis Presley on the first date, but I just could not resist. And his mother and father fished, Elvis fished, all his friends fished, June fished, everybody fished. I didn't fish, I was busy taking film, taking footage with my little eight millimeter camera. <laughs> it was happening so fast and so furious and so quick. Everything was, it was, it was Ed Sullivan, it was Steve Allen, it was Hollywood, it was New York. It was something that, uh, that I would never trade. I'd never, I, I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. The history of rock and roll is filled with provocative stories and interesting personalities. While hundreds of individuals can take credit for, in some way, shaping that history, no one can lay claim to having a greater impact on rock than the king, Elvis Presley. From his humble beginnings in Tupelo, Mississippi, to his rise within the grandeur of Graceland, Elvis's accomplishments as a singer, a performer, and a movie star have never been equaled. The public side of Elvis Aaron Presley is one comprised primarily of glitz and glamour. However, the real Elvis was actually quite different. A shy country gentleman is how he's described by those who knew him, especially in the early years of his career. It is those years, specifically 1956, that we will journey to today as we discover the truth of Elvis's lost love. Elvis's musical career started in school when he bucked the image of a regular guy with his own style. George Klein, longtime friend and member of Elvis's Memphis Mafia, remembers what Elvis was like in his teenage years. When I first met Elvis was in the eighth grade. It was Christmas time, and he asked the teacher, uh, the music teacher, if he could bring his guitar to class and sing, and she said, sure. He got up and sang, and, and I couldn't believe it because that wasn't the thing to do at that time in 1948. In high school, Elvis was kind of a shy guy, sort of a laid-back, quiet guy, unassuming, but he stood out in his own way. He would let his, his hair was longer than anybody's hair in the school, and he had a, a little bit of a, signal, a sideburn on there, so that made him different, but he would, the thing that really made Elvis stand out in high school was the way he dressed. Everybody was wearing uh, maybe a t-shirt and uh, a pair of blue jeans or what have you, and Elvis would come to school with a pair of dress pants on with maybe a black bear pants with a pink stripe down the side, and, uh, a sport coat with a maybe trimmed in white with a collar turned up. And as he walked down the hallway, you could miss him. But that was his own way of making a statement, sort of a velvet hammer type situation. The summer of 1956 witnessed the Yankees win the World Series. The United States sweep the Summer Olympics and a nation mourn the sinking of the Andrea Doria. It was also the summer that a 21-year-old singing sensation from Memphis, Tennessee, began an innocent summer love affair with a 19-year-old Southern Belle from Biloxi, an affair that would bloom into a secret that remained untold until now. The story of how Elvis Presley first asked June Winico to be his wife. It had all started with a chance meeting just one short year ago. The summer of 1955 found Elvis on the road, promoting his name and first record by touring the South. He was living in cheap motels and performing just about anywhere he could draw a crowd when he first laid eyes on June Winico, an enchanting beauty he would never forget. June had come with a friend to see Elvis, a person she knew nothing about, perform at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. I met Elvis the first time by accident. A friend of mine wanted me, had seen Elvis the night before. I didn't even know who Elvis Presley was. And uh, she called me, that, and he was appearing at the um, Airmen's Club at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. So um, she called. I already had a date. She said, I'll help cancel your date. You know, make a long story short, we went to the Airmen's Club, and uh, he was just the best-looking thing I had ever seen in my life. He really was. Little did she know that her chance meeting with the young sensation that night would transpire into something much bigger with a vacation the next summer. June remembers the first time she visited Memphis with her friends. So as soon as we got to Memphis, 
Um, we went to uh, down in the area where Elvis used to buy his clothes at um, Lansky Brothers, I think is the name of the store. And Marie asked one of the salesmen there where was what was Elvis's address. And um, he gave her directions and he said, I'm sure Elvis wouldn't mind you going by to see his house because he's not in town. So we drove over to Audubon Drive, parked out in the front. There was no fence at the time. And um, there was heavy duty construction equipment parked in the backyard. And we figured, you know, with the backhoe and all that stuff, we figured he was having a pool put in. And we're still sitting in Marie's car. There's five of us girls that went. And we're debating on what kind of swimming pool he's gonna have put in. Guitar shape, whatever, you know. So I said, well, I'm, get, I'm getting out. I'm gonna go take a look. <laughs> so I got out, the rest of the girls followed. And we're up just, you know, bigger than life, trespassing on Elvis's property and and the pink Cadillac drives in the driveway so and it was Elvis and his mother and father so I was the only one on the fence the other girls were standing back a little bit and uh, I was I was embarrassed really to be caught trespassing or, or whatever and um, and I just looked around made eye contact with him just for a second and he walks straight up to the fence and picks me up by the waist and puts me on the ground. He said, what are you doing here, June? And I said, I'm on vacation with the girls, you know. And we talked um, probably 15 or 20 minutes. He wanted to know where we, we were going and did we have any plans. And we told him that we were going to see a movie that night. And, you know, we all left. And um, then that night we were sitting in the, in the movie theater. And uh, my friend had a hot pink Ford Fairlane car. You couldn't miss it. Hot pink, not just pink, <laughs> hot pink. And um, he, he found the hot pink car parked at the theater and came on in and, and sat next to me and held my hand throughout the movie and, and uh, then invited us all to go back to his house. I rode with him in the big, his big black limousine that he uses for the band. And, uh, I mean, it was room enough for all of us, but we took the car just, you know, they followed behind. And um, so we visited with him that night. And then the following morning, he picked me up, and we went motorcycle riding. And after seven days um, of being in Memphis, we drove back to Biloxi, and he said that he wanted to, uh, he, would, he was coming down, he had a vacation coming up, and he would be down in Biloxi. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> As a close friend, George was privy to Elvis's personal impressions of June. He just said that she was great looking, uh, she had a terrific figure, she had a great personality, and uh, that he really, really liked her a whole lot. He really did. And I didn't even kiss anyone on the first date. And I don't know why I couldn't resist kissing Elvis Presley on the first date, but I just could not resist. So we were standing out on um, a pier, Moonlight, moonlight on the water, picture this. <laughs> and he was standing behind me. We're both looking out at the water and, and the moon. And he's kissing me on the back of my neck, you know, raising my hair up and kissing me on the back of the neck. And <laughs> so, and then he turned me to face him. And he said, why are you trembling? Silly question. <laughs> I was trembling with excitement. You know, <laughs> why are you trembling? I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. You know, and then so then, but he was a marvelous kisser. Elvis had real soft, full lips. So he he said I was a good kisser. He wanted to know where did I learn how to kiss, and I said I didn't know that kissing needed lessons. I'd never, you know, and I said I think I'm learning right here from you. Elvis had said that he had a vacation coming up and he was going to come and spend it in Biloxi. And so sure enough, the first part of June, Elvis arrived in Biloxi. We had stayed in touch by phone uh, before he came down and, uh, and he came to Biloxi. And I wasn't home, but um, he was pretty upset because when he drove up in front of my house, 
the whole street and everything was filled with, I lived pretty close to Sacred Heart Girls High School. And school was out, and all these girls were piled up in my front yard, and Elvis just, I mean, it was just a big welcoming committee, but, but I was nowhere in sight. And I didn't really know when he was coming in. And he got really mad with me because he thought I told everyone he was coming. And I said, Elvis, you drive into town in a white Cadillac convertible with the top down and a Tennessee license tag. And you think I told everyone you was coming? <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyhow, that was, that was a fun experience. Tired of the constant barrage of fans outside his hotel, Elvis craved some privacy. June and her friends had just the solution. Well, when I first met him, he had to leave the motel down here in Biloxi because of the fact that people found out he was, he was there and they, they were kept coming by and banging on his door and everything. So I said, Elvis, I got a couple of houses. and I said, I can let you have one of them. If you and your friends want to stay there, you can come to the house and stay. I said, it's already furnished and all. It's a small house, but it's big enough to accommodate you. And he said, I think that would be nice. So I took him to the house and I took him in my car so people wouldn't recognize that Cadillac of his. But anyway, some of the neighbors spotted it and spotted the deal. And the first thing you know, the crowd was all around the house aggravating him. Come on out, Elvis, and give, and give us your signature. Come on out and sing for us. And so he was trying to get a little rest and take a nap, and he just couldn't. So he said, Eddie, he said, I guess I'm going to have to go somewhere else. So we called up Gulf Hills and got him a room, got him a house out there at Gulf Hills. The highlight of Elvis's Biloxi vacation was the day Eddie and June took the young star deep sea fishing for the first time. Uh, Mr. Bellman wanted to do something so that he could spend some time with Elvis, mainly because he was impressed with Elvis as a gentleman. He, um, he liked Elvis because he respected his mother and father. He, everything he said was yes sir, and no ma'am, and thank you, and please. And he was a real, just a real Southern gentleman. And Eddie admired that, Eddie Bellman admired that in him. And uh, because he, El Eddie had not really kept up with uh, Elvis's career or anything like that, he liked him as a young man. So he, s he thought he would arrange a deep sea fishing trip. He had a friend that had a charter boat. It was just a beautiful day, just like today, and we had terrific luck. We caught a nice variety of fish, and everybody was very happy and enjoyed the trip immensely. Okay, so Elvis enjoyed it so much, he and his friends, oh, they were singing on the boat and having a ball and everything in between, in between fishing. After that trip, on the way back to Biloxi, Elvis asked if I could arrange to get the boat again because he wanted to invite his mother and father down to go with us. Two days later, we went again. His mother and father came down the next day, and I met him and brought him out to where Elvis was at Gulf Hills. And the following day, we went fishing again. And his mother and father fished, Elvis fished, all his friends fished, June fished, everybody fished. I didn't fish, I was busy taking film, taking footage with my little eight millimeter camera. He brought the lunches, he brought donuts and all kind of sandwich cold cuts and cold drinks and everything. And I'm not sure, because I don't think Eddie knew that Elvis liked peanut butter and bananas as much as he liked them. And, but I think Mrs. Presley brought a jar of peanut butter and bananas. She brought bananas too. Also some cookies. She had a, a bag of cookies. But somehow during the day she managed to make him a peanut butter and banana sandwich, which we all came to call uh, an Elvis Presley sandwich. His mother was looking after Elvis like he was a young child, and she was, kept bringing him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches while he was sitting here where I am fishing. And she was handing it to him and feeding him while he was fishing, and that's a fact. I, it's on the film. All that's on the film. 
We caught uh, lots of sharks, uh, Jack Crevel, they weigh in like 60 pounds. We caught some ling or lemon fish, um, they're good to eat. And we caught uh, lots of bonita, bonita's a sports fish, it's a very bloody fish, but it's uh, pretty, hence the name bonita means beautiful. And um, we, just, we just killed the fish that day, just had them strung up like you just wouldn't believe. I brought a bunch of German officers' caps back from Germany with me during World War II, and I gave them to Elvis and all his friends. Okay. They put on the caps, and they started singing on the boat here, and I took film of that. Uh, octoon, that's all they ever said <laughs> in a Memphis twang. Octoon, you know how you do the Heil Hitler, Octoon, that's this. <laughs> Eddie Bellman had been in the war and brought those hats back as souvenirs. And Eddie, knowing that we should have had hats on to be out in the hot sun that length of time, brought those hats for us to put on to fish to keep the sun out of our faces. So that's why they had those, those German hats. That's, that stick is a boom on top of the boat. And it looked like a giant uh, microphone. And, I mean, that was just one of the spur of my, he was just standing up there and he saw this big thing and he went behind it and started pretending he was singing to this tall mic. And it wasn't, it was just the boom on the boat. It was funny. That was, was funny. What started as a quiet day on the deserted ocean ended with another assemblage of crazed Elvis fans. First of all, before we got back into Biloxi, a boat approaches us and we're on our way in. And when there's a courtesy on the water, when a boat approaches you, it's because they need something, they need help. So our captain slows for this boat to come alongside and two reporters jump on the boat. So this kind of ticked Elvis off pretty good, you know, because, I mean, what an invasion. Um, so in the film footage, you will see that Elvis is sitting up on the bow of the boat. I reach over and adjust his belt because his name is crooked on it. But the reason we were up on the front of the boat is because Elvis had put a friend here on this walkway area, another friend on this walkway area to block the reporters from getting to him. And I just... You know, because, I mean, they had no business doing that. You know, the man's there on vacation, he needs a little privacy. So, anyhow, when we got back in, we agreed to go in and take a picture with all our catch, which is the normal thing to do. And um, they asked a few questions. Elvis wouldn't get off the boat, wouldn't talk to him. And so they took a picture that's a, a family picture with me standing there with Elvis' mom and dad and the boat captain and everything. Elvis and I stayed on the boat. His mom and dad, everybody got off. We stayed on the boat, and Mr. Bellman, he told the captain to take the boat down to the factory. And that way we could lose, get away from the crowd. And don't worry, he would bring the cars down there to us. I don't know how he managed to do this, but he did. And it was about um, a four-mile ride from where, where we were down to the shrimp factory. So we pulled the boat in behind the shrimp factories, and we got off the boat. But all the way down, there was lines of cars keeping up with us up on Highway 90. Just a whole stream of cars. They knew that that was Elvis's boat out there. And they were going real slow, keeping up with the boat. We made it down to the factory. They didn't know where we were going. The cars didn't. And how Elvis slipped off that boat and got in the captain's car, I don't know because I didn't even see it. And his, his daughter, he got in, he said, lay down on the floor and she'll take you to the sun and sand. So all, everybody was, it was a line of cars, like a parade going down the beach. We could see them from the, on the boat. And they didn't know where Elvis disappeared to, because he, he really could do some disappearing acts. <laughs> anyway, I brought some skeet targets out to uh, Gulf Hills, and I brought my little 28 gauge Remington automatic, which was my favorite gun. And it had a little bit more spread to it than the 410 gauge that I gave Elvis, so I let him shoot my 28 gauge so he'd have a better chance at hitting the targets, you see? 
And he did pretty good. He missed a few, but he hit, he hit a little more than he missed. And he let his friends shoot and all that. We just had a ball. Somebody brought a BB gun up there. And everybody started shooting a BB gun and people started, even Elvis, he held a cigarette paper in his hand like that to let somebody with the BB gun to shoot the paper out of his hand. He did, that's a fact. And luckily the guy didn't hit his thumb. <laughs> but anyway, he was, he was kind of daring like, you know, he, he had a lot of spunk in him. We, he was skiing out at Gulf Hills and he had a, a shirt on and a life, life jacket because of that because he had gotten sunburned. You know, it don't take long to get sunburned out here if you're not accustomed to it. And if you're fair-skinned like he was, he was sort of fair-skinned. Throughout the remainder of the summer, June and Elvis continued to see each other as much as his hectic schedule would allow. Elvis was so love-struck, he would often just jump into one of his cars and drive to Biloxi as fast as he could. It was during one of these romantic journeys back to Biloxi that Elvis Presley asked June Winico to be his wife. We were laying out under the stars over uh, the hack house, the house that he rented for the summer. Had a big front lawn that was kind of like a sloping hillside with nice clean cut grass and everything. And we had taken a, a sheet from the bed or blanket and laid it out and was laying under the stars and um, getting pa passionate kisses. And now we'll, we'll just cut to the, to, the, uh, to the question. He said, I can't get married right away. I promised the Colonel I'd wait at least three years. And uh, he said, will you wait three years for me, June? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll wait. You know, I was, and I was not in any hurry to get married. Even though I did get married the following year, out of spite, I think. June could tell that her priority in Elvis's world had declined significantly. And when on Christmas Day in 1956, he didn't call, she knew that their long romance was about to end. The two-year-long romance came to an end in March of 1957. Today, June met Elvis's train in New Orleans to break the news that she'd had all that she could take that she had decided to marry someone else. I just, uh, I, I told Elvis I was engaged to be married. I just blurted it out. I didn't know how else to tell him because I had, to, in, my, in my mind and in my heart, I'm going over there, I'm making this trip, and I'm telling Elvis Presley that I have met someone and I'm engaged to be married. And, and I hope it hurts him, you know? And after seeing him and, and, um, and everything, it was really hard, and I just, uh, he kept saying, you gotta come home with me, I got a surprise for you. Mama can't wait to see you, and you're gonna stay on the train with me, and um, one of the guys can drive the car back to Biloxi, and all this, he was just ranting on and on, and I said, I can't go with you, I'm engaged to be married. And he just looked at me, you know, because I hadn't spoke to him in, other than a telegram in probably four months you don't if you if you love somebody you don't put them on hold that long do you I don't think so mm -hmm. and I really I really and truly had fallen in love with a terrific guy I mean the marriage lasted 34 years it had to be a pretty good marriage you know uh, but uh, I mean terrific guy and I, I I couldn't break his heart so I had to tell Elvis I mean the thought crossed my mind you know but I couldn't I couldn't um, Elvis didn't need me he had worlds, you know, the whole world full of girls of his choice. And this new man in my life needed me. I couldn't, I couldn't break his heart. So that's how we said goodbye. When June became engaged, we heard about it, and I think Elvis sent her best wishes and congratulations and all, and they remained friends. Uh, but you see, Elvis wasn't ready to get involved and get tied down at that time. He was still rocking and rolling, and it was all happening, and the, the, the world was his at that time, you know. As I reflect back on the early days of Elvis, and I'm talking now in the 50s, maybe early 60s, nothing will ever equal that in my mind. It, it was something that money couldn't buy. It was happening so fast and so furious and so quick. 
everything was, was, it was Ed Sullivan, it was Steve Allen, it was Hollywood, it was New York, it was Hawaii, it was Canada, it was Million Records, it was Gold Records, it was uh, movie stars coming in. It was something that, uh, that I would never trade, I'd never, I, I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. Well, I think he was just a plain uh, American young star, gentleman, and uh, he liked fun, and he liked good times, and he liked people, and he was just a nice person. Now, when I look back on it, it's like a different lifetime, because it's, it has been so long ago, but I've, I really feel blessed that I've had, you know, the opportunity. And there's some regret there. I'm um, happy and healthy, independently wealthy. What more could I want? <laughs> if I could change the way that things turned out, I would go back and do things different. I wouldn't have been so quick to to leave or so, you know, without finding out. But I was a little stubborn, a little hard-headed, and I was not going to allow anyone to break my heart. And so it's probably a combination of me, Elvis, and Colonel Parker, <laughs> you know, that ended our relationship. Although he lived for only 42 years, Elvis Presley left behind a legacy of showmanship, dedication, and raw talent that would forever change the way the world defined rock and roll music. And although there are thousands of film clips, photos, and recordings of his accomplishments that survive today, the precious few minutes of raw 8mm film shot by a shoe clerk in Biloxi in July of 1956 remain as the only portrait of what the real Elvis was like.